So isogenies are the main topic in, well, isogeny-based crypto. So let's dive into what is an isogeny. So, so far we've seen elliptic curves and I've motivated via some graphs that, well, if we have some similar graph, then we can do nice cryptography. Now, what isogenies are, this are maps between two elliptic curves. And we do insist that this is not the zero map, so it doesn't map all of E to the infinity point on E prime. Um, but unlike isomorphisms, these can have some exceptions. So these don't have to be given by polynomials, they can be given by rational functions. So they can be a fraction, and well, for the roots and denominator, those points disappear to well, infinity. And this map has to be compatible with the group operations. So for the points on E to be added, so you're adding P plus Q on E, and then applying the isomorph uh, isogeny has to be the same as applying the isogeny to P and to Q separately, and then adding them up on E prime. And then there's a definition of degree, and we're only going to see separable isogenies, so I'm only defining what the degree of a separable isogeny is, namely that's the size of its kernel. So those points that map to E prime um, are the kernel, and the number of points in there, that's the degree of the isogeny. It can't be all of E, and it will be at least one, namely the point infinity of E, because it has to be a group homomorphism, so the neutral element has to map to the neutral element, but everything in between that is possible. So let's see some examples. Now you have seen how to add on look to curve, and you have also seen the square multiply method, okay, or for an additive group, the double in and add method. So you know that for any integer m, you can compute, well, let's say, a positive number m, you can compute a map from e to itself by computing p times a point, so p times each point. And so yes, that is definitely compatible with all the group operations, it's just n-fold addition. And um, it can be given by rational functions, I mean the whole group law is given by uh, rational functions, you've seen this on the Montgomery slide. So this looks like an isogeny. So what is the kernel of this element? So we need this in order to determine um, the degree of the isogeny. And then a structural theorem for the curve that is that if m, well for finite fields, if m is not zero congruent, uh, congruent to zero model characteristic, so in general if m is not equal to zero in the field where this curve is defined, then the kernel is isomorphic to z mod m times z mod m. So the, the elements that are mapped to infinity by the multiplication by the m map are denoted e of m. So those are the points which have order while well, dividing m. So if m is a prime, it's order 1 or p, and if m is not a prime, then it's orders dividing m in general. And so since there are m times m elements, the kernel has size m squared, and so the multiplication by m map is a n degree m squared isogeny. But normally we expect that an isogeny takes us from one curve to a different curve. So let's see another example which again should look familiar. So here we have a map from one curve to another where we turn the x-coordinate, well, we negate it, and for the y-coordinate we multiply by square root of minus 1. So that's another feature of isogenies, they don't need to be defined over the field we're at, so maybe the field where this curve is defined doesn't have a square root of minus 1, but we can be over extension field. And so this takes points from this left curve onto the right curve, well you can just verify this, plug in minus x instead of x, and okay, so then the x cubed and the linear term ax will change sign. The b has only the same change sign from the curve equation, and so we're adding, we get into a point which would be minus y squared on the previous curve, and so the new y would be minus square root of minus one, uh, square root of minus one times y. Now this map, you can actually go in both directions. If you want to go back from the right curve to the left curve. We can just apply this one again. Well, you're negating y, so that's idempotent, and then you're dividing by the square root of minus 1 to get back to the other curve. So that means it's an isomorphism. Yes, it looks exactly like the maps I described, 
of minus 1 is the square of this other thing, which is, well, square root of minus 1 is equal to the cube, square root of minus 1, okay, there is a minus sign somewhere. Um, so this is a typical isomorphism, and so the kernel is just one point, so this is a degree 1 isogeny. Okay, so now we've seen two trivial examples, let's see one real one. Now, real examples, as you can see, are less pretty. So down here we have two Weierstrass curves, so y squared equals x cubed plus x, and y squared equals x cubed minus 3x plus 3. And you can convince yourself that for any x, y on the first curve, the complicated formula there is a valid point on the second curve. And you also notice that the um, polynomials and the denominators will disappear, will vanish at x equals 2. And so then plugging in x equals 2 into the equation of the left hand side, so you're getting 2 cubed is 8 plus 2 is 10. And then depending on what field this is, you're getting a square root for that or not. But again, the kernel would also be looking at extension fields. And now over f71, 10 is actually a, 10 is actually a square. So the point 2 comma 9 and the point 2 comma minus 9 are non-trivial elements of the kernel, and of course that's also the point infinity. So there are three elements in this kernel, and so this is a degree 3 isogeny. So with a multiplication by 3 map, we would get a degree 9 isogeny, but with this more complicated map, we can actually get a degree 3 isogeny, so without the squaring. So the topic of this lecture, or this sequence of lectures, is isogeny-based cryptography, and so the take-home message is isogenies are very nice maps or well-behaved maps between elliptic curves. They might grow up, a little, they might grow a little bit. They're not so nice to present on on the slide, but it's something you can easily implement. And then these isogenies form what is called the isogeny graph. So each node is a curve, and then there's an edge between two curves, if and only if there's an isogeny. And then you can distinguish any isogeny or an isogeny of a certain degree. So for instance, you focus on degree 2 isogenies, then you're getting the degree 2 isogeny graph, and then, well, you're moving around in that one. Um, typically, we care about some subgraphs of the isogeny graph. First of all, if two curves are not isogenous under well, any degree, then there will never ever be an edge. So they will be on, on disjoint components. And so we're looking at just those components because, well, then the walk will be containing those. But if you have such a nice component, then you can deal, uh, you can define something which is very close to, yeah, a post-quantum version of Diffie-Hellman. And okay, there are more protocols based on the same idea. So here we have two examples of isogeny graphs. We have something which looks exactly like this Dreamcatcher picture that I showed you for the uh, square multiply method. And on the right, we have one which is a lot less structured. And so you might wonder, like, which one is the right one for doing cryptography. And in some sense, we like something with structure. We understand this well. and We're used to this from the square multiply. On the other hand, often enough, structure is problematic for security. So no structure might be better. And in this case, the interesting answer is, well, which one is, is good for cryptography? And actually, both of them are good depending on what you want to do. There are actually two families um, of different systems using isogenies, and so the left graph corresponds to the C-side family, which we'll cover first, and the right graph corresponds to the SIDH family, of which PSYCH is the uh, one submission to the NIST competition. And they have also different properties. So the, the uh, left one, the C-side graph, um, is using a fine field of prime order, whereas the right one is using uh, fp squared. And there's some more influence of this definition on what it actually means to be a node. So I was saying it's elliptic curve, and it's actually um, isogeny class, uh, so isomorphism classes. So if the two per curves are isomorphic, so there's a degree one isogeny between those, then we identify them. So each dot will actually be more than one curve. It will be an isomorphism class of curves. And then for C-side, we consider these classes up to isomorphism over Fp, whereas in SIDH, we consider them 
up to isomorphisms over any extension field. So each dot means something different depending whether you're on the left or the right. And of course, I have to explain to you what these lines are. So seaside, um, just to be sure that this is pronounced seaside because, well, we developed this when we were at Tenerife. This is an actual photo from where we were in 2018. We worked on this together with uh, Walter Kastrick, Chloe Martindale, Lawrence Panni and Jost Rehnes. Um, so seaside is the closest thing we can get to post-quantum, when to a post-quantum Diffie-Hellman. We can reuse our keys, it's something we're used to, and you'll see in SIDH that it's actually a problem. You can uh, blind your keys, that means you can kind of do something like in Tor the protocol. And we don't have a difference in the protocol between the party initiating, so Alice or Bob, whoever goes first. There's a very short compact representation of each of those. And so it's just one field element for this FP. And Alice can just publish her public key, as you would expect, and they use each other's public keys to obtain a shield zero. And this can be a one-time public key and can be a long-term public key. And of course, there's a lot of math in here that I'll currently glance over, but we will actually go through all the details in this course. If you're just interested in implementing it, it is not much more complicated than elliptic curve arithmetic, so you need to be able to add points on the elliptic curves, and you need to compute these uh, isogeny formulas, but that also just boils down to operations in the fine field. So one slide for C side. What we're doing here is we pick a whole bunch of small primes, so three, five, seven, and so on, up to 500 something, and okay, it's actually not all the way up to, it's actually up to 384, the 384th prime, and then another prime to make this product there be prime. So this is four times the product of all these little primes, minus one. So if you're taking p plus one, you're getting four times all these primes. That will play a role. Namely, the number of points on these elliptic curves stated there, so four suitable chosen A, they will have exactly p plus one points. And such curves are called super singular curves. We're going to get to that definition in the next lecture. So if you are in the situation where you have a curve with that many points, well, defined by some parameter A, those are the sets that we're going to consider. And we're looking at Li isogenies for those Li that have picked up there, which are moving between these curves in the set X. So here's a picture of this. This is an actual picture for the case of P is 419. And I'm drawing now the blue ones are three isogenies. So I arranged the elliptic curves so that three isogenies are adjacent. <clears throat> and then the other ones are five isogenies and seven isogenies. There's a lot of math behind this. I'm gonna see some of this. But the interesting take home message is we can walk on this graph efficiently. And there's an understanding of what it means to walk left or to walk right. And we can walk on each of those graphs, the blue one, the red one, or the green one. So if now Alice and Bob want to um, do this key exchange, well, they care about sizes, so Alice just has a single coefficient. But let's see what Alice and Bob are doing. They both would be starting at a predefined point, that's similar to how they would start with a known group element. And then Alice picks that she wants to go two steps in the positive blue direction. So I'll be going positive for the counterclockwise version and the negative for the clockwise version. And then the color indicates which graph she's going to be in. So Alice will set off with doing one step in the blue direction. And at the same time, Bob has done his key. Let's do very short keys, just four steps east. And his first key is going in the minus direction on the green graph. So here's one step that each of them is doing. Now, of course, it looks like Bob has gone much further than Alice, but that's just a form of illustration. Each of those is a graph and, okay, the three isogeny is in fact cheaper than the five isogeny, but it's not horrendously much more. And then Alice is doing another step in the same blue direction and Bob now picks a positive direction on the red graph. So let's see where they go. Well, 
small step, big step, then else does one big step in the negative right direction, Bob does one negative in the green direction, and then finally else does one negative green, and Bob does one negative blue. At this point, these are their public points. They have done enough steps. Now this is a very small example, and if you, well, if you know where you started, you know how to get to these points. If this is a large enough graph, so you can't actually draw it, and you just know each of them went four steps on a subset of these graphs, you shouldn't be able to trace it. Or four replaced by two to the 128 large steps. Okay, so they now exchange these points. So Alice gets magically transported to Bob's graph to the space, uh, to the place that she was at on her own graph. And then Bob gets moved to Alice's graph on the same dot. So you see like Bob was one off from the center and he's then moved to one off from the center on Alice's graph. And similarly Alice on the other one. And now for the Hamann ball, you expect that each of them can do the same. And yes, this is a nicely well behaved graph. So if Alice and Bob are now continuing what they've done before, so Alice on Bob's graph is doing her part and Bob on Alice's starting point is doing his part, here are the four steps happening. And then by the power of math and magic, they both reach a point which is basically just south and a little bit to the left. So yes, these steps commute and um, with this we now have a very small, very simple version of the seaside key exchange and what we're going to do in the next lecture is actually understand where these formulas come from, what it means to do a step in the blue or green direction, what it means to be a plus or minus.